Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches. I'm Tenyola Shoboale. On the program this week, world leaders condemn Russia for alleged civilian killings in Butcher as forces retreated from near the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. As the Russian army retreated from areas it previously controlled this week, the devastating toll of the war became clearer. Growing evidence of atrocities against civilians has prompted world leaders to threaten even harsher sanctions, including a lockout of Russia's vital gas industry. This is what's left of Dimitrivka, a Ukrainian hamlet about 22 miles west of Kiev, after Russian forces advanced and occupied the area. For a month, Leonid Varesh Chagin and his wife sought refuge in a friend's basement. He calls it a living hell. Uh, we were with them when they were visiting houses because they were trying to open some, some cupboards and looking for something, but we were... Uh, I have a very brave wife, she was watching them, uh, making clear that they should not take anything. Most of the 300 residents left, but around a third remained, coexisting with the Russians as their tanks patrolled day and night. On the 30th of March, uh, at around 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, the, really the hell, <laughs> that, that, that was the hell which started. From one side, we, uh, we were hearing the, the, um, the, the tanks uh, uh, shooting at us, on, uh, and from the area of Buche was a massive uh, mortar uh, uh, shelling. So one of the shells uh, landed uh, uh, one meter and a half from the area we were having this interview. So we were uh, uh, at the shelter at that point in time. Uh, it was okay, but it's something like you having a cask and someone is hitting uh, by hammer <laughs> from, from above. So this is kind of feeling. A few days ago, while the Russians were patrolling the area, Ukrainian troops arrived. When the Russians returned, unaware, there was a fierce battle. Beresh Shagin and his wife escaped in a car through the woods through a brief break in the fighting. Russian President Vladimir Putin says the rationale behind the invasion, which Moscow calls a special operation, is to denazify the country and to protect Russian speakers living there. Veres Shagin, whose mother tongue is Russian, dismisses Putin's claim, saying he's never experienced any problems being a Russian-speaking Ukrainian. Meanwhile, since Russian troops withdrew from towns and villages around the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, Ukrainian troops have been showing journalists corpses of what they say are civilians killed by Russian forces, destroyed houses, and burnt out cars. Addressing the Security Council on Tuesday, Ukraine's president told council members he was speaking on behalf of the civilians who died in the six-week war by asking them to remove the Russian Federation from the organization. Immediate action is needed. The UN Charter must get its force back again immediately. The UN system must be reformed immediately so that the right of veto will not become the right of death, so that there is a fair representation of all world regions in the Security Council. And now, we need decisions by the Security Council for the peace in Ukraine. If you don't know how to adopt the decision, then you can do two things. Either remove Russia as an aggressor and a source of war from blocking the decisions on its own aggression and its own war, and then do everything possible to bring peace. Citing allegations of war crimes committed in Ukraine, the U.S. also pushed for Russia's removal from the U.N. Human Rights Council. This moment requires responsible world powers and global leaders to show some backbone and stand up to Russia's dangerous and unprovoked threat against Ukraine and the world. The Secretary General said that confronting this threat is the Security Council's charge. It is, and it is also the responsibility of UN leaders and leaders around the world, every single member state with a voice in the GA. No one, can be a shield for Russia's aggression. Suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council is something we collectively have the power to do in the General Assembly. 
The Kremlin has denied allegations that Russian forces have committed war crimes by executing civilians, saying it's propaganda aimed at denigrating the Russian army. Now we're seeing blatant criminally staged events with the Ukrainian civilians that were killed by the radicals to accuse the Russian army. Those killed in the areas from which the Russian forces withdrew after encouraging peace negotiations in Istanbul. Now it turns out that we shouldn't have withdrawn. I'm talking about Bucha, first and foremost. I understand that you were shown corpses and heard testimonies, but you have only seen what they've shown you. You cannot ignore the inconsistencies in the version of events which are being promoted by the Ukrainian and Western media. However, Ukraine's allies have announced fresh sanctions against Moscow. We've now banned coal, but now we have to look into oil and we have to look into the revenues that Russia gets from the fossil fuels and we really have to make an effort, for example, to take a share to the escrow um, to an escrow b banking system so that we will really limit the source of revenues from Russia, from, um, from fossil fuels. It has to be an end with that, and this is the next step we have to take together. So far, our sanctions have had a crippling impact on those who feed and fund Putin's war machine. This week, we will announce that we've frozen over $350 billion of Putin's war chest making over 60% of the regime's $604 billion foreign currency reserves unavailable. Our coordinated sanctions are pushing the Russian economy back to the Soviet era. But we can and we must do more. EU nations also expelled more Russian diplomats on Tuesday amidst increasing outrage over the Ukraine conflict in coordinated moves that saw more than 200 envoys and staff sent home in 48 hours. Six weeks since Russian forces began their devastating invasion of Ukraine, and already more than 4 million refugees have fled to neighboring countries. As more Ukrainian refugees cross the border into Poland, volunteer workers are calling for more help from the government. 37-year-old Kamil opened a shelter in the Polish village of Boratin when the conflict in Ukraine began, with the hopes of providing food, shelter and support to the refugees entering Poland. But after six weeks, Kamil and friends helping him are exhausted, running out of funds, and worried they will let down the refugees under their care unless something changes. So we received zero, fund, zero donation from the government, from NGOs or from any other organization. So it is only what people with the open hearts gave us till now. So it is how we are running with money out of our pocket, with not sleeping for many days, with work for 24 hours per day. So this is how it is being run right now. However, we are just bleeding out and we just require the proper institutional help to, to, to support all these people and not to disappoint them again. He says his team are working around the clock to support around 500 Ukrainian women and children. Men have largely been restricted from leaving Ukraine by the country's authorities. The charity helps the refugees with shelter, schooling and finding work. But despite plentiful donations of basics, Prasinowski says what is really needed is simple. It's money. We've got approximately 500 mothers and children with us. We deliver shelter, we deliver food, we deliver hot uh, meals. And uh, we started doing the, the education for children. Uh, so we've got private kindergarten. Uh, we've got uh, children started going to, 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 pri to, pri uh, to primary school, to high school. Some, some women already have got the job with, with us or with our partners and it is just done by the group of good friends from high school. If we want to pay for gas for our shelters, we cannot use wipes to do that. If we want to buy cheese for, for children or milk, we cannot use, I don't know, uh, cookies which we receive or cans with meat. So the needs are very different right now and this is very specific uh, currently and I'm embarrassed to say I'm not a professional helper but what we need really it is the proper donation which is money. According to UN agencies more than 4 million Ukrainians have fled abroad since the start of what Russia calls its special operation in Ukraine.
In the last six weeks, as we have heard, at least 1,430 people have been killed, among them over 121 children. And we know this is very likely a serious underestimate. Homes and civilian infrastructure, bridges, hospitals, schools have been damaged and destroyed. And in fact, the current figures on displacement tell us that more than 11.3 million people have now been forced to flee their homes. And of that, 4.2 million are now refugees. About 2.5 million of them have crossed into Poland and more are still arriving. Though the numbers have slowed since the start of the war, according to Poland's Border Guard Service. Ines, a 34-year-old doctor from Portugal working at the same center, is in desperate need of hypertension and diabetes medication for refugees. This organization, these foundations need help to pay the bill of the electricity, the water, the food, stuff like that. We, the healthcare providers, we need also help to provide medication, chronic medication, and uh, like, uh, I don't know, help to pay our car to go to one center to the other center. We are needed here and um, uh, yeah, it's a problem. We need to continue to tell the story, show people that these persons are still here. Uh, some people are going back to Ukraine again, but some people can't do that. So they are still here. They need our help and our cooperation. And uh, that's why it's so important to tell the story. Despite the calls for more help, refugees living safely in the shelters say they are grateful to the exhausted volunteers. And in Greece, the drawings in a makeshift classroom tell the story of Ukrainian children who escaped conflict, tanks, bombs, burning buildings and bodies on the ground. In a small apartment, which now functions as a school and haven for dozens of young Ukrainians and their mothers who fled the invasion, psychologist and teacher Regina tries to heal their wounds through art therapy. For three days and a week, this small apartment in the Greek capital functions as a school and a haven for dozens of young Ukrainians and their mothers who fled Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In one room, teenagers put their thoughts on paper. First time when I saw them, they was scared a lot. Now they're not. Like, because they in a safe place, they have, uh, like, I think they have everything to, to feel comfortable. Nasra Dinova, who has been in Greece for eight years since leaving Crimea and works at a school, which before the conflict was a Saturday school for Ukrainian children born in Greece to learn the Ukrainian language. The school is now struggling to cope with more than 40 refugee students run by volunteers and their own funds several days a week. Nasra Dinova gathers the children in a circle on the floor to talk about their drawings. She describes how a sketch of a Ukrainian tank by 13-year-old boy depicts his feelings to seek safety inside the tank. He's 30 years old, but he's like five years in him Owen because he wants to hide from all this situation. He wants to sit in this tank, in Ukrainian tank, and uh, don't see it, don't feel it what he feel now. Besides drawing, the children of various ages also keep busy making crafts. Three of the teachers at the school, including Yulia Maximova, a teacher from Odessa who is in Greece with a 10-year-old daughter, are also refugees. It's very hard. It's very. My soul is broken, but um, I'm happy that I uh, I can help children. Little, but but help. Her husband stayed to volunteer with Ukraine's territorial defense forces. I am strong, I must live for her, I must be happy when happy mother, happy her child. Since February, over 1.5 million children have fled Ukraine, which Russia calls a special operation in Europe's fastest growing refugee crisis since World War II. A third of the 16,000 Ukrainian refugees in Greece are children. When Foreign Dispatches returns in just a moment, we take a look at Africa's participation at the just-concluded Expo 2020 Dubai. Please stay with us. You're still watching Foreign Dispatches on Channels Television. 
Despite the humanitarian assistance from dozens of not-for-profit organizations and voluntary groups, third country nationals and international students who have fled the war in Ukraine still face months of uncertainty as their residential status is unknown and the fate of their university education is out of their hands. Our correspondent, Juliana Olainka, spent some time with some young Nigerians in Budapest who have been seeking the support from the Nigerians in Diaspora organization on the ground. Six weeks on from the beginning of the war, it's here in the streets of neighbouring countries like Hungary that carry the trauma of those who spent days fleeing from Vladimir Putin's bombs. The stories of the international students who fled Ukraine is a story of life-changing dreams dashed in an instant and dashed in the most devastating and cruel way. Dr. Oluwase on Newton, a 30-year-old medical graduate, had lived in Kharkiv for almost a decade. On Saturday night, I think that was the worst of it. It was bad. It was really bad. And I was like, God, just get us out of here. That was just the only thing for like... Maybe eight, nine hours cons constantly, we could hear the bombings and the buildings were shaking literally. And I don't know if you could. Um, I had shivers. I couldn't even sleep. I was just shaking. I couldn't cry because I like, Shion, you can't even afford to cry now. Just hold your tears in and pray for safety. Nigerian community leader Daniel Mugiada is a medicine graduate from Kharkiv National University. It's like you travel and you want to go home, but you can't because there's no home. So for most of us, that's how it feels like. It feels like we are on a journey home that we have not gotten home. Here in Budapest, Nigerians in Diaspora Organization, or NIDO, has become a lifeline for Nigerians. What's the reality of this situation? Um, honestly, it's a very terrible one because uh, when you look at these children, when they speak to you, you understand that they speak like kids without hope. Uh, they don't know when the war will stop. They don't know when they are going to go back to school. Even if the war ends today, it needs time for them to rebuild. So they are also here with frustration. They don't know if they are going to kick them out, if they are going to send them to like immigration camp to stay. So for me, leaving my business, my family to be here, it's not that... I love doing it, but I have to do it. Especially when you see them, you see that when they are sick, they don't know even the hospitals how to speak Hungarian language, how to get a taxi, how to get food. So it's very difficult for you to just look and pass without trying to help them. Now that phase one has come to an end, what next for those who have fled? It's as really traumatized us, most especially us that are close to graduating and we don't know the way forward from there because like what's going to happen? I'm almost done with my six years medical school. Am I going to start again from the beginning or will I be able to transfer to another place? Those, those are the decisions and those are the questions that are running in my head. In most parts, the Hungarian citizens have been assisting with the refugees and our foreign students. But the landlocked nation has its own socio-economic issues. How long are they going to be able to assist? And finally on the program, away from the crisis in Ukraine. Expo 2020 Dubai, which kicked off in 2021 and ended March 2022 after a one-year delay caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, recorded 24 million visits at the end of the six months long event, themed Connecting Minds, Creating the Future. In this final Expo 2020 report, our correspondent, Mayowa Adeguke, focuses on the participation of African nations. Take a look. Expo 2020 Dubai has been spectacular for many reasons. Now, not only have organizers staged this event in the midst of a pandemic, it is also the first expo in the history of expos that African countries get their unique pavilions to showcase their unique offerings. Now, that's a major plus. Rich displays of African heritage, culture, innovation and opportunities greet people of multiple nationalities as they move through the African nation pavilion.
from entertainment to investment events and many more, these nations have in the past six months taken the golden opportunity to tell their stories of progress and opportunity to a global audience. This has been great because we were able to put a spotlight on ourselves and also the fact that we have our own pavilion it gave us an opportunity to brand it the way we want and not be subsumed under the Africa brand. We know we are Botswana and we are from Africa, but we also wanted to show that Botswana is no longer Africa's best kept secret. So by having our own pavilion, it gave us an opportunity to brand ourselves more and also to be more visible and to be, uh, to, you know, to step away from, you know, the, the, the shadow of other big uh, players or big countries. It has been a very big opportunity for Zambia to showcase its opportunities. Yes, the other thing that I can mention is uh, the connecting mind from the theme itself. Yes, we've, be, we've been able to connect with different countries and see how we can, uh, we can, we can progress as, uh, as a world at large. Yes, so um, uh, Zambia itself has managed to, to, to attract a lot of investment from this expo. Uh, yes, so we have a lot, of, a lot of investors who want to come to Zambia, of course, and do some investments uh, and come to Zambia and visit, yes. As we all know that we cannot develop as a country, but we need to connect as each and every country and different people. Body Nigerian filmmaker Tommy Lola has been to all pavilions at the Expo and has been documenting notable exhibitions. African countries really uh, exhibit more of innovations. We, like I said, we dealt more of the heart and craft and all that. But I think we can adapt some of these innovations on exhibition to how we live our life in, in our own part of the world. So, uh, like in sustainability, talk about uh, uh, climate change. There are different innovations about climate change that, that we can adapt to also uh, to uh, our own uh, living. So, which, which is also great. Overall, we, we, I, I would say we do badly, but we are not there yet. But we can always, uh, there's always room for improvement. And we've seen what it's, what, uh, what where the future holds, and we can key into different opportunities that we have. So, yeah. Speaking of opportunities, many African entrepreneurs are already taking advantage of all that Dubai, the host of Expo 2020, offers. We've spoken about investment opportunities, we've spoken about um, you know, you know, how it is, that, you know, how do people work I and mean, how they're getting on if they're working here in terms of bringing in talent into Dubai, you know, are there opportunities for visas, are there opportunities to you know, where where they live, etc. All these things um, have been discussed and it's all been positive. So I know that we are all going back with um, a more positive view of Dubai. It's certainly, I, I was certainly inspired. And um, so who knows what the future holds. I would also hope that for Africa, our tourism departments, our economic departments, uh, we're going to be more open and accommodating to um, uh, visitors to come and um, uh, even do business, whereas uh, the business environment is made friendlier. Safety is more um, guaranteed for people. Um, and just rule of law, you know, that we can show visitors that we are stable, we are open for business, and uh, we're welcoming and accommodating for them. With the Expo's end, the site will now be repurposed to become a smart and sustainable city called District 2020. Some of the country pavilions, they belong to the countries, uh, the, the self-build ones. So India, for example, is going to reuse their pavilion as an India house, where they would do all their business meetings and their trade negotiations and so on. So that's the purpose they have. Uh, Siemens, one of our main partners, is, is having a whole hub based here. Uh, and very much going to be part of that. So a lot of the smaller pavilions in our thematic districts are going to remain, but will either be sort of small areas for start-up businesses or for accommodation as well. District 2020 is expected to open in October 2022. Well, this is where we say goodbye till next time, but remember our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelcv.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Tenyo Lash Shabuale. Bye for now.